So <laughs> uh, we'll go ahead and get started so that we have enough time. I'll watch the participant list. So as people come into the waiting room, uh, I will let them in. Uh, as I said, thank you so much uh, for all of you joining us today, this afternoon. Um, we hope that we can provide you with some um, important and educational information for grant seeking and um, how to develop your applications and position yourself for success. Um, my co-host is Susan Taylor with the, oh yeah, Su Susan Taylor from the library. Um, <laughs> my name is Augusta Isley. Um, I am a senior proposal manager with sponsored projects here at Ball State. And then my colleague, Erin Ball is also on um, to uh, help with anything that, uh, funding opportunities wise as well. Um, so I will let Susan um, get started. And if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I will monitor for Susan and Susan will monitor for me as we will be doing some screen sharing. Um, so feel free to just like pop your question into the chat and we'll address it as we can. Okay. Well, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many people here on a Friday afternoon. I think it's interesting to me that Friday afternoons end up being um, a good time for webinars somehow. Um, but it's, it's great to be here with you. My um, What I plan to cover for my, my little portion of our hour today is to talk to you about some of the um, a library resource um, called Web of Science that will be useful for you in several ways. We'll talk about just, you know, in case you haven't been introduced to it. Um, how to use Web of Science for just doing your kind of literature research so that you uh, so that you know what you're researching and how you can use it to find possible sources of funding as well. Um, we'll spend a, a moment talking about their researcher profile, and then that will lead us into talking about the ORCID ID, which will be really important for you to do as a researcher if you haven't already set that up. So we'll just talk about why that's important which will lead us to talk about the science CV as well. And then in kind of a, a different mode, I do want to introduce you briefly to a new um, browser extension that we have access to um, just uh, uh, from the past, oh, let's see, maybe we've had it for six or seven months. It's called LibKey Nomad. So a few things that um, I want to go over with you. So we will um, start by on the library's homepage. So the library's homepage will be how you will get to um, our databases and things that sort of uh, allows you to get special access as being part of the Ball State community. In order to get to Web of Science, we're just going to scroll down and look for the databases link under popular services and resources. So in case you haven't been here before, um, this shows you the 335 databases that you have access to as someone affiliated with Ball State. So they're alphabetically listed here, but if you want to browse them by um, big discipline area, you can do that using this all subjects drop down. Um, I am going to click on W to jump to Web of Science, and I'll just point out that these little eyes will help you to, you know, get more information out about any of the databases. So Web of Science um, may sound like a, a database that is really focused on the hardcore physical sciences and um, it is not that actually, it is broader than that. So it includes the social sciences, it includes the arts and humanities. So it is um, broad in terms of subject coverage, um, but its focus is really on uh, in allowing you to search for high impact journals, articles within high impact journals. So the important stuff. Um, so it's going to be really uh, good for that. Um, and also has some specialized features that are unique and useful as you search for grants. So I already have uh, typed in here a search that I was going to do if I was interested in finding articles about how um, parks and trees and green space affect public health in cities, especially maybe looking at um, air quality. So I, I split up my the different parts of my topic and allow for some synonyms or related terms. I encourage you to, you to do that sort of thing. Notice that you can get more specific with the all fields drop down there in case you have an author or title or whatever. And I'll just send that search off. So we found 179 results. Um, your, our search is right up here at the top. Um, and what I'll just point out is that by default, 
our results are going to be sorted by relevance. And that's kind of, you know, usually the way things go with any sort of database uh, uh, that we use. But Web of Science allows you a whole bunch of different ways that you could sort your results should you be interested. Um, the one that I think can be quite useful is to just sort, sort by number of citations. So if I if I click there, this is going to bring to the top out of those, you know, almost 180 um, records, which of those have been cited the most. So this one at the tippy top has 1,809 um, documents that have cited it since it was published in 2014. Um, so that can be kind of cool. I'm going to put it back to relevance ranking because I'll show you over on the left here that there are some nice um, quick filters that you can also explore that, again, are really specific to Web of Science. So out of these 180 some records, 11 of them have been um, defined as highly cited papers. So papers that, and they take into account um, how long it's been since the paper was published. So something could have come out, you know, a year or two ago, but if it's, if it's had a whole lot of interest generated in it, it could still qualify as a highly cited paper. So if I click um, here to see those 11, I'll have to click on refine to bring them up. And of course we have that, the one that's 1800 at the top of the list. So this is just a way, I mean, I think it's important if you're if you're doing uh, some research on a topic to know the, the different um, research that's been out there that has gotten a lot of attention. So this is a really fabulous way to do that. And I imagine some of you are, are already familiar with that. As you add um, different limiters on in Web of Science, it makes it easy to change things by just going up to the top here. So I can click X to take off that um, highly cited paper limiter. Notice that I could um, click here to see a hot paper. They have some way of deciding you know, what a hot paper is, something that's getting a lot of interest. Again, if you want to narrow to review articles, you can do that as well. Um, what I thought we would look at now is to um, actually scroll down even further because there are lots of filters on the left hand side. Uh, and you might find different different times and different situations where you might want to limit by affiliation, by author's affiliation. You might want to limit by specific journals that you're interested in. But we are in a grants workshop. So this funding agency's um, limiter is going to be the most useful for us. So if we click here, this is going to show you out of those um, 179 uh, records, the different agencies that funded the research. So I can click on see all and it will list them all right here. And this is a great way to get an idea of, you know, four um, articles in my field or research that's been done related to my topic. These are the biggest um, agencies that have um, funded stuff. The first one there is out of China, so that's not going to help me, but you, we can see some others um, down here as well, the National Institutes of Health, for example. Um, so this will, will give you a good list to, to start with and to get some ideas from. I'm going to scroll down just a little bit to bring up one of these records because I, I want you to see kind of what a typical record looks like in here. Um, if I click on the title to bring it up, we can see that it would be easy for me to get to the full text. There's a full text at the publisher's website for this one right here, and it was on the um, results list as well. If we didn't have that, then we could use this find it button to see if we have access to that article from maybe another database or through another subscription that we might have. I'll point off, point out rather that on the right hand side, we have the citation network area. This kind of gives you the um, the article genealogy. So uh, what came before this article? Well, all these things that the authors um, included in their reference um, area, their reference, um, the references rather. And since the article has been published, as we mentioned, it's had 1800 some documents cited. Clicking here would bring links to those articles up for me. And I should, I should actually say that these are 1800 articles from within the Web of Science database. There are probably even more than that. Um, we've got the basic stuff here, you know, the abstract. Notice that there's a, there's talk of or a link to the ORCID ID here and the uh, Web of Science Research ID. We'll come back to that. So we can get, you know, a feel for what this article is about. And as we scroll down, we can even find out more information about the funding for this particular piece of research. 
So we've got the funding agency and the grant number. Looks like there were a couple um, grants issued. And I can click on show details to find out more information. So this can give you um, an idea of, you know, uh, well, lots of different things, right? Who funded it, um, the, the total award amount. Um, and there is a grant summary here that, that um, would probably be helpful to read through. Um, gives you an idea of what, what a grant summary can look like and um, how you might write yours up, for example. And so that is the, the second grant there. So this is, for starters, just um, a useful way to get ideas for the sorts of agencies that might fund the, the kind of research that you're doing. Um, when I scroll back up here, I pointed out this link up here that says View Web of Science Research ID and ORCID. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and click here, and this will bring up, uh, there are three authors of this article, and there are three entries here, but notice there are actually two Jason Burns. I suspect it's the same person. But what these numbers um, allow us um, is the, the authors, through these numbers, have an individual unique ID that has been assigned to them. And this is going to be Im important to you. Um, those of you that have been doing research um, for a while can, can already understand how this might be important. Maybe you've already set something like an ORCID ID up for yourself. Um, those of you that are just starting research, if you think about um, the fact that um, there are lots and lots of researchers out there who might possibly have a name that is similar to yours, or, you know, if we're looking at abbreviations, um, might be pretty close to yours or look the same, having a unique identifier is, is vital, is really important. And um, Web of Science has a, a researcher ID that you can set up by going through their researcher profile and setting up um, an account, which is going to be free. It would allow you to link to all of your works that are included in the Web of Science um, and make sure that even though maybe in this one article you went by um, just your, your first two initials and your last name and this other article you included your whole first name and your, and your whole um, middle name, um, you can link those together and say these are all the same person. These are me. Um, I want my things to be findable um, using um, this the Web of Science Research ID. So that, again, is something that's easy for you to set up on your own and to search through Web of Science and find your, your things and say, these are mine. Um, the other thing that's broader than that is an ORCID ID. So the, they are linked over here. If I click here, this will bring up uh, Joshua Newell's um, profile in ORCID. And I guess with that, I will make sure we all know kind of what ORCID is. So ORCID stands for, and I keep spelling it with an H, but it's not with an H. It stands for Open Researcher and Contributor ID. Okay. And so an ORCID ID is a unique open digital identifier that is going to distinguish you from every other researcher with the same or similar name to yours. And I, th I thought I would bring up this little piece from uh, an ORCID tutorial that suggested if your name was Sofia Maria Hernandez Garcia and you went, you know, in different times in your career, you published under different parts of your name, um, there are probably other people, you know, who go by, um, you know, a similar name. And my last name is Taylor. My goodness, there are so many Taylors out there, right? So, and, and definitely Susan Taylor specifically. So um, the ORCID ID is going to allow you to um, get more, to say, you know, this is me. And in setting up an ORCID ID, which is free to do, you, um, you uh, it makes it possible for you to include, to link to uh, works that you have been a part of. So research that you've done, research that you've participated in, and more, as we can see from Joshua's um, uh, profile right here. So you can include information about, uh, you know, where you went to school, your employment, um, you can include your, your education, uh, your and different funding possibilities that you have you've had. And then your works are going to be, these are going to be the, the articles, the, the research that you've published. Um, so this can be really Im important. And um, 
getting this set up again is a free thing. If I just go to the main um, ORCID page, this gives us a few a little bit more information. It's really pretty easy to look through and get reasons for setting up this ORCID ID, which nicely it tells me right here that some people call it ORCID and some people call it ORCID ID. So you can do either one. There's not a right or a wrong. Um, but uh, getting that set up, you can then more easily do lots of things, not just, you know, linking to your works and saying these are mine. You can also actually um, link out from your record. So you can allow organizations that you're affiliated with to add information to your record um, on, on your report. And also they can read data directly from your record. So essentially this gives you a chance to, you know, you set up the, um, the account, the profile rather with all your information. And you don't have to keep repeating that through all the different paperwork that, um, you might be asked to, uh, fill out, in, you know, for, for employment, for definitely for grants and maybe, you know, for lots of other things. So this makes it so that hopefully um, it will save you time and hopefully it will make it less possible that, that errors will be made. So, uh, so I strongly encourage you to get this set up. Uh, the other resource that I wanted to mention was Science CV, and I'm going to click on this up here. So this is, um, You'll want to know about this. This is an electronic system that researchers can use to create and maintain bio sketches that have to be submitted if you're going to be applying for um, grants through NIH or um, NSF. So obviously, these are very large granting agencies. And um, so you will have to go through and set up a science CV um, bio sketch, but um, you can link to your ORCID ID. So what I would encourage you to do is set up that ORCID ID. And then if you're thinking of going through um, NIH or NSF, then you'll be able to easily link the information from your ORCID profile and bring it into that bio sketch. And there's, there's more links here about how to do all of that. Um, so I guess, I guess I might pause at this point and see if anybody has questions about um, about what I've gone over so far, because the next thing I'm going to talk about is going to be different. Any questions? Understand. There, there aren't any in the chat. I did um, add some links, okay. um, both to the ORCID site and the um, Science CV. Awesome, awesome. Great, so you guys can link out to there. Okay, um, so as I said, the next thing I want to talk about is a bit different. This is the, um, the LibKey Nomad extension. So I'm gonna go back to the library's homepage. And um, what I want to show you now, as I said, this is a, a, a browser extension that you can add onto the browser that you use the most often that will allow you, if you're searching through um, a resource like Google Scholar or Wikipedia or PubMed or even publishers websites, so um, resources that are away from the library's homepage where when you're using those, the, the sites don't know that you are associated with Ball State. Um, if you find documents there or you find citations to documents there uh, and they're wanting to charge you maybe $19.99 to view that document, LibKey Nomad will give you a way around that. So, and it's really easy to add this extension from the library's homepage. All you need to do is go to do research. So just do research. And right towards the top, there's this big blue um, bar that says download LibKey Nomad browser plugin. So if we click here, this will take us to that, the LibKey Nomad page. Just scroll down a little bit and you can choose the browser that you use the most. Um, for me, it's going to be Chrome. It's going to you know, take me to the Chrome web store for me. And I'm gonna say add to Chrome. This guy looks so excited, doesn't he, about LibKey Nomad? Um, so I will say add extension. And then what it's gonna do is, is ask you to select your organization. So we, you will select Ball State. You can just start typing it in. And then it will show you uh, what the little icon is gonna look like when you come, when you are on a page that has some citations, that has some DOIs, uh, um, that it can link out to, you will see this little green teardrop. 
um, that says download PDF. So I will show you, for example, I had already pulled up a Wikipedia page on the uh, idea of a compact city. And we know that, um, that the references in Wikipedia can often be quite helpful because there's good stuff. Even if you might not use the actual text of the Wikipedia article, those references can be really nice. So this is the way my references page looked before I added the libkey nomad. Now, if I'm just going to um, refresh it so that it looks again at it with the, the browser extension. And look how it adds all of these little buttons where we have where um, Ball State University is able to provide you the full text. So any anywhere where it says download PDF, you're going to be able to for sure get to the um, the full text. Some of these say access options, so that most likely means that maybe maybe we have it here in print form, or maybe it's something that you'll need to. Um, uh, uh, let's see, request, you'll need to get through interlibrary loan. And that little access option is going to make it easier for you to do that. So that was just um, quickly uh, the, the wonders of LibKey Nomad. Um, so I will go ahead and stop my share and see if um, anybody has questions at this point. I understand if you don't which actually just makes me, I'm um, sorry, I'm going to unshare my, I'm going to share my screen one more time because I want to show you um, from the library's homepage really quickly. What, if you do have questions, if you scroll down and go to ask a librarian, it's easy to reach out and, and ask for help. So there are lots of different ways that you can ask for help. So I did want to make sure you know that because probably the questions are, are going to happen later and I understand that. So thank you. All righty. Over to you, Augusta, unless anybody has a question. <laughs> uh, thanks, James, for, for that. He says loads of information to digest. Um, question, backtracking, what is your take on ResearchGate? Would you also suggest getting a profile in ResearchGate? Um, I guess I, I avoid ResearchGate, but... Um, I don't know that I have the ultimate um, opinion on that, to be honest. I, I guess I feel like we have so many other sources that we know are um, reliable and um, are authoritative and everything that I avoid it, but I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna actually tell you, definitely don't. I don't know if you have an opinion, Augusta, about ResearchGate, but. I, I don't, I have very, I think, I was aware of it when I first started, um, but not, I don't really have an opinion on it. Yeah, yeah. Why would, okay, why would you avoid it? Well, my, under, I, I don't think I can speak very, <laughs> very um, well to this, but my understanding is that a lot of the things that are included in ResearchGate are, might not have been added there necessarily with the author's permission. And I, I may be wrong. They may have um, changed things since the last time I, I checked. So there, there are some things that are just downloaded from, um, uh, downloaded from with, without author's permission, I guess is, is really what I want to say. And then it's, it's not, it's not as legitimate of a database in, in my book. We can definitely um, do some sourcing of information and just with a quick Google search, I saw there's a uh, uh, like a an article from uh, NIH uh, that talks about the credibility of ResearchGate um, and some other uh, resources. So we can definitely compile some of those uh, for further further consideration. Yeah, exactly. That, that would be great. So I, I see that um, Marlies, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, um, had a question about browsing. Um, they are exactly both from um, Third Iron. Browsing was a, a um, an app that we had that allowed you to browse through, as you can imagine, through journals and things that we had subscriptions to. So if you knew of a particular issue that was focusing on your topic, you could easily see all of the articles within that. Um, and actually, it's it is kind of included when you are 
are looking for um, articles from within our databases. So if you find out that we have, uh, it's gonna be hard for me to come up with an example right now, but there are links that will say um, view uh, issue when you when you are getting to the full text of your article. So, um, so that is kind of linked on its own, but uh, I'm gonna just look, we do not have it individually available separately on its own. Oh no, I am wrong. I am sorry. Uh, we actually do. So let, let me just show everybody real quickly. I was like, no, nah, do we still have that? So browsing is available down here. This is just on the A to Z databases page. So browsing, we'll, we'll just hover on this little eye so you can see, you can browse the magazine and journal titles that we have digital subscriptions to. So this can be a nice way to keep up with journals that um, you're particularly interested in. So I'm glad you asked about that. And I'll stop the share again. Susan, maybe I'll follow up with you later because that doesn't link anymore to the app that comes out of browsing. So okay. that I'm wondering how to do that. So I'll follow up with you later. Thank you. Okay. Okay. That yes, please do, please do. And I, I will look into it for sure. Yes, thank you for um those questions. That's great. Um, and like I said, this this is being recorded and we'll um share all of these additional resources with um, everyone who registered today. So um, I guess we'll um, now talk about um, grant stuff. And again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I am going to share my screen as well. Oh, it's loading. Okay, great. Um, so I'm currently on the Ball State, the web the, uh, libraries page, but I'm going to go to our page, Sponsored Projects Administration. Um, we are a sort of a one-stop shop for all things um, grants and funding. Um, we do everything from helping faculty find faculty and students find funding opportunities to um, applying for uh, those item, those, those opportunities and uh, putting together their grant proposals and their budgets, and um, then all the way up through submission. And then we do have a, a negotiation team and a post-award administration team. So if you are, um, if we are lucky enough to be successful in finding, obtaining uh, a grant opportunity, um, then, we uh, can also help you administer it. So um, on our, well, let's start, let me, let me go back to the basics. So why, why would anybody want to get a grant? Sometimes is the, the, the first question. Um, well, grant funding, um, it's not necessarily free money, but it's definitely a resource that can help you do your work um, your scholarly activity, whether it is uh, bench science all the way through um, creative projects, community engagement, things like that. It can allow um, faculty and students to uh, financial resources to be able to go out and do more. Um, for faculty, it's particularly of interest because you can get um, some of your time either um, bought out um, of a course, or you can get um, summer funding to go do your work during the summer. Um, it can provide you financial resources to get a graduate assistant or undergraduate student hourly workers, um, lab supplies, or just supplies, um, consultants to come in and speak um, or provide you with their expertise, um, travel, participant support, either for participation in a, a program, like a training program, an instructional activity that you wanna put on, or um, participants in the, the realm of like research incentives for um, study participation, things like that, um, are all things that have been paid for um, by grants. And those can really um, enhance um, your work as a scholar. And then ultimately we wanna be able to 
um, use use that work to then um, publish and get all of that good work out into the world um, for that general knowledge. So that's why you would want to get a grant. Um, so like, how do you, how do you do that um, is the question that I, I usually get. So it starts with um, that good idea and uh, then engaging with um, sometimes your colleagues, other times if you have an idea and you wanna get it funded, you can work with your proposal manager. Um, I am one of six right now. Um, proposal managers that um, have assignments all over campus. Um, if you see this link here, it says contact a proposal or grant manager. There is a proposal manager um, assigned to um, almost every department or unit on campus um, that you can contact to discuss your agenda or what you're thinking or finding out if that funding opportunity that you have is actually a good fit. Because um, sometimes it's not um, a good fit for the project, but um, even if it's not, we can help you identify one that is maybe a better fit. Um, another thing, since we do work pan campus, we can um, really provide uh, feedback, suggestions, whatever, um, if you need a collaborator um, or you need evaluation services for your grant project. If there's something that you want to do or need, um, likely we in this office um, can help you sort of identify those additional resources that can make your project stronger. So um, to find a funding opportunity, there is absolutely nothing wrong with a straight up Google search. I have found a lot of good opportunities that way. Um, however, I know that search strategies can be hard for um, some people who aren't necessarily comfortable with um, like the Google um, search functionality. Um, honestly, I find that just asking a question of Google helps. Like that's a really great place to get started. But um, beyond that, we do have uh, resources, subscriptions, a subscription on at Ball State um, called SPIN that um, is just, it's a database for funding opportunities. And so I'm going to show you that. So I'll just click on find funding and it's separated into two um, audiences, one for faculty and one for students. They're um, very similar, but students uh, also include um, things like um, the teacher scholar program, uh, which if you haven't heard of, I strongly encourage you to check it out. Um, and then funding for school, which we get a lot of questions about financial aid, but we are not the financial aid office. So we just put that there so that um, students get to the right place if that's what they happen to be looking for on our website. So um, under faculty, we have opportunity websites. This includes grants.gov, which is the um, sort of like clearing house for all federal um, funding opportunities. Um, of course, every agency has their own um, website that you can certainly go out to. Like if you know that you're really into the CDC, then you can go to the CDC's website and check it out there and they, have, they will have their funding opportunities listed. Um, but if you just need a place to go, um, grants.gov is fine. Um, the Indiana State Department of Administration, these are more for contracts, state contracts, um, but we do obviously have a really great um, partnership experience, expertise um, with the state of Indiana. So sometimes there are um, uh, contractual things that Ball State would be appropriate for. Candid.org used to be the foundation center um, and GuideStar, but they joined forces. And this is a really great um, uh, website to find like smaller, maybe nonprofit foundation type opportunities that um, are maybe more niche, uh, but they also, there's uh, the Philanthropy News Digest that you can subscribe to and it will send you um, 
opportunities. Like I'm, I have a daily digest and it's like, you know, maybe three or four opportunities. And uh, even if none of them are appropriate or we're not even eligible, it just like um, can get my, my brain moving about like, oh, you're, you're familiarizing yourself with that language um, that funders use that um, sort of is part of the grants world. Um, so it's definitely helpful even just to, to start familiarizing yourself with the way that that language is. Um, other resources, you probably don't need to worry about these because the Federal Register is a bear and SAM.gov is um, more for us than it is for actual funding resources. Um, and like I said, uh, there's the Aspire Internal Grants, which I will talk about in a little bit. The Teacher Scholar Program, um, which matches um, professors as mentors to undergraduate students and gives them um, a, an opportunity to have a, a mentoring uh, partnership. And at the end of it, there is a um, the uh, ability to uh, share out um, the, the things that they have discovered over the semester. And before I go into the SPIN database, are there any questions? Okay. Um, so as I said, the SPIN database, it is a um, subscription service. Um, this is not the be all end all, but it is definitely a place to start. Um, I always suggest uh, if you don't wanna start with the, the wide, world of Google, um, you can come here and then uh, there are links out to um, sponsor websites that you can then find more information. So we'll uh, click over into the database. And this is also linked on the university libraries website. So in that list of uh, 300 some odd databases, it's linked there as well. Um, and here you'll just wanna sign in using your institutional credentials and choose Ball State from the dropdown. And then it'll take you to this very familiar um, single sign-on page. I tried to get through this uh, so that I wouldn't have to type my password in in front of you, but it um, now we have to do that every time apparently. So <laughs> I at least didn't have to do the duo again. Um, so this is the interface. As you can see, it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, it is a simple search. Um, and there are then some options for you. Um, once you sign in, um, that, that's your account um, and you're able to then sign in from um, anywhere uh, since it's a Ball State single sign-on situation. Um, this system does allow you to save your searches, um, bookmark certain opportunities and um, set up a search that then sends you funding alerts. So that means that um, when it does, it's like a weekly um, review of that search. If there are new hits in that search, it'll shoot you over an email and say like, hey, this search um, found a new opportunity, check it out. Um, so there are three ways to search. There's the basic text search, um, a keyword search, because again, this is a database. And so everything is categorized by a keyword. And then there's the advanced search, which is like a little bit of everything. Um, I will say that a, a way to set yourself up for success in searching for a funding opportunity, because it is kind of like finding a needle in a haystack, um, is one, um, just keep doing it. Um, keep doing some searches so that you're familiarizing yourself with the process and able to like read through and kind of see what the titles are, who are the sponsors in your field. Um, if you're doing a search and like nothing is making sense then maybe um, try a different, a different avenue, um, some new keywords. Um, if you, before you go searching for a funding opportunity, I do recommend that you sort of do a, um, like a thought um, exercise with what do you want funded so like, if you're a student, do you need field travel um, or maybe lab supplies or research incentives to um, incentivize your uh, survey um, participants? 
if you're a faculty member, do you need time? Um, do you need a research assistant? What, what types of things do you need? And within that, then develop um, like a, a short summary. I always say the elevator speech, but it, you know, like four or five sentences about why your work is important, why um, someone should care, and the sort of the, the meat of, of your work. And out of that, you should be able to come up with like two or three keywords about what your work is. So uh, piggybacking on um, Susan's search, I'm gonna use green space and air pollution and see what we come up with. I haven't done this search, so I don't know. <laughs> we'll find out. Four whole opportunities, amazing. So um, this is essentially what you get. It can, and it looks the same, whether you get four or 4,000. Um, it gives you um, the title, um, the sponsor, if the sponsor has a designated number, if there's a deadline attached to it, the funding amount may be the total of the program. It may be the total of the award. Um, it, this is kind of all over the place, um, but this sort of gives you a summary. And then uh, from here, you can actually click into the opportunity and this is gonna pop up a new window. You probably can't see. <laughs> There we go, okay. So this is what the funding opportunity looks like. Um, here's the title and the um, deadline date, none posted. Uh, it's 2 million for four years. Uh, and then it gives you a little bit about eligibility. The thing about eligibility as a, um, for I'm gonna say 90%, of um, grants is faculty apply for grants on behalf of the university. And so it's not like an individual applying to a grant opportunity. It is, it goes in under Ball State's name. And so um, that means that we Ball State are then fiscally responsible for that. So that's what this institution of higher education um, the eligibility note is. Um, and then individuals may participate as PI or co-PI in only one proposal. So that is important. Some, um, some competitions allow you to um, submit multiple applications. In this case, uh, it may like, that may disqualify you completely. Uh, here's the program information. So here's a link out to the guidelines. Um, again, if, if you look at this opportunity and you're like, oh, this seems great, then you definitely wanna go out to the sponsor's website and read more. Um, obviously the NSF is, um, the National Science Foundation is a large uh, organization with lots of money. Uh, and you can generally glean that they are going to fund science research, um, but for, you know, foundations or nonprofits that have grant opportunities, you'll definitely want to make sure that the mission of their organization fits with what you want to do um, because it's their money and you have to convince them to give you their money um, and then also convince them that um, you will be a good steward of their money and um, do the things that you say you're going to do to change the world. So um, always go out and learn more about the sponsor. Uh, and then there's a little synopsis about the program. This particular one has uh, sort of some tracks that um, you can apply to. Um, and NSF is certainly more detailed in their guidelines than a lot of other agencies. But, um, you know, if, Again, if you're looking at this and you're like, ah, oh, this, I think this fits, but I'm not really sure, you can engage your program or your proposal manager to help you sort of suss out the details and make sure that this opportunity is actually a good one for your work.
Uh, and then beyond that, once you get through all of this um, stuff, <laughs> this explanation, uh, it does have a link here to say like, hey, if you like this, please email your proposal manager. Um, uh, just more information about eligibility, more information about the funding um, available, the deadline. Um, NSF has rolling, uh, some of these like rolling deadlines. Uh, this is past, so uh, whatever, but here's also like some nuts and boltsy details about um, the sponsor. And then all of these keywords. So, you know, maybe this one didn't, uh, didn't fit, but you would be interested in um, energy efficiency. And then you can click on energy efficiency and I don't think you can see it, but there's a window that pops up and it, it gives you some additional, um, some other um, opportunities that um, click with that keyword. Um, and so say this is a, a great opportunity, but the deadline has passed and it looks like there may be another one. You can bookmark it and, or email it to um, yourself or a collaborator um, with these two options here. And then a little window pops up and you can either, um, again, I don't, I don't think you can see this, um, but a window pops up and it says create new group. Um, can you see it or no? Okay, good. Um, it says create new group, um, or you can add it to an existing group. I've done some searches for people. Um, and so I can add it to one of these if I wanted to. Um, and then I can come back to it later. Um, so we'll click back into spin um, and say, I did this search and, but like I, I had to run off. Um, I can export it uh, through this export button. It goes to a CSV file um, or I can save it um, by simply clicking the save button. And then again, a little window pops up and says, what do you want to name it? Um, and as a, an administrator, I can actually send it to a particular user or I can save it to my own, um, my own account. And then once I do that, it comes up here in my saved searches. So you can see that I've done a number of searches for various things um, across campus. Um, I can also set these to be public searches um, so that, uh, so like these are in my account, but if somebody were to go out into their account and not at, and as, as an administrator, they would be able to see those and run those searches themselves. Um, for your funding alerts, um, these are just the searches that I've done and I have funding alerts on all of them, but you can actually manage them and turn them on or off if you want um, emails to come from those searches. And then here again is your bookmarks. So I have um, a couple of particular opportunities um, bookmarked for um, these um, people, mostly from previous um, sessions that I've done. Now I'm gonna take a breath and uh, if there are any questions. No one's entered any in the, in the chat, but okay. feel free to folks. Yeah, feel free. Um, I do want to um, talk a little bit about some um, resources that are available on our website. So. Here we are back on the funding opportunities page on the SPA Ball State website. And under funding opportunities, there's this proposal components. And we have compiled um, sort of like the high level components of um, a general grant application. Obviously guidelines are going to guide you in um, those uh, like what a sponsor really wants to see, but generally these are the, the things that you can expect to um, have requested in uh, an, a grant application. And so there's the narrative, that's the meat, um, that's the how you're gonna do it, um, your goals and objectives, um, evaluation, dissemination, sustainability. Um, your budget is obviously a reflection of 
it should be a reflection of your narrative and um, no surprises. Like if you're doing a study on, you know, razor scooters, you shouldn't ask for bicycles, for instance. Uh, and so yeah, we have some information. We do also have some information about indirect costs. Um, I know that that can be a main concern, a concern, not a main concern, but a concern for um, faculty um, doing work. Uh, indirect costs are simply put the cost of doing business. They are real costs. And um, we will only, we will also only pay what the sponsor, or we will only request what the sponsor allows. So if, and a lot of, especially smaller funders, they won't allow um, indirect costs or they will um, request that we use a lower rate. Um, but that, in my many moons of doing this, I have never had a budget not go forward um, because of an indirect cost problem. So um, just all of that to say, work with your proposal manager. Um, we are here to help. Um, and the budget can be like the scariest part of any grant application for a lot of people. So um, we're here to help. Uh, the bio sketch is just a resume or a CV. Um, we have some information here about science CV as well, um, about why it's important, what it can help you do. Um, I think something that uh, Susan touched on is that um, all of these systems connect in some way and um, I've been working with academic systems here on campus because there is a way for um, Science CV and the ORC ID to interface with um, digital measures. Um, I don't believe it's up and running right now in our instance, but other universities have done it. And um, we definitely want to, to encourage Reduction of administrative burden for entering all of those things in every system that you have to enter them in. If we, if you can put it in one and then import it into other systems or have that system go out and grab stuff from something you've already entered, that's what we want. We do not, like, nobody wants to enter the same information into 17 systems. Um, so keep that in mind as um, you sort of noodle around with the purpose of ORCID and Science CV. Uh, current and pending are, um, sim that's just your current and pending support. Um, some of the, like, uh, typically it's the NSF that requests these documents, but others do as well. Just, it gives um, the sponsor kind of a, an overview of, of your work and how um, it's being supported. Um, and also, um, how, how committed you are in terms of the time you've already committed to, to other projects, the project you're requesting funding for or whatever, um, that just gives them insight. Um, data management is becoming increasingly important. Um, there are new uh, regulations around that from the um, NSF and NIH. Um, if you're interested in um, sh that, I'm happy to provide more information. We're still getting um, sort of familiar, from familiarizing ourselves with the new regulations, but basically it's like, okay, federal funding is taxpayer money and taxpayers should be able to uh, access um, scholarly work uh, freely. It should be data sharing, data, um, all while keeping the secure stuff secure and sharing the things that can be shared. So um, this sort of covers a little bit of that. And then the DMP tool is the data management plan tool. And it's very cool. Um, it helps you design a data management plan and sort of prompts you with questions um, that then you can respond to instead of being like, I don't know what a data management plan should include. And then broader impacts is, um, it's your work and what are the broader impacts? Um, what are the, the ramifications? How many students are you going to be engaging with your work? Um, how is it going to fit within um, the, the literature that already exists? So right, you've done your literature review and then you take your work and you say, look at all this, this is how my work fits into that. 
Um, so that's just what the major components are and gives you a little bit of detail and some further reading if you're so inclined. And then there's a lot of FAQs um, that we still need to get updated, but <laughs> should give you a good overview of things you might um, want to be concerned about. So that is the, the bulk of what I have to offer um, in terms of finding funding opportunities and uh, what components are part of a grant application um, and why you would want to get a grant. So I will stop sharing and um, any questions that you might have about what we've discussed today um, or just sort of if you've been considering something what um, what questions do you have kind of generally? I know it's a, it's a lot to sort of process and, and consider. And of course, if you wake up in the middle of the night with a burning question, you can always email us. Well, if there are no questions, um, like I said, I'll follow up with this reporting and um, we'll provide the, the additional information. We'll, we'll look into sort of what the deal is with ResearchGate too. Um, and yeah. yeah. I think with ResearchGate, I may have focused on some controversy that happened in the, um, in, you know, the late 20 teens. Um, then, and I think they've cleaned up their, their act. So it's probably, it's probably legit at this point. They just had a bumpy patch. <laughs> all right. Well, um, thank you all again so much for joining us today and have a lovely weekend. I think, I hope it's going to be nice because I want to go outside. <laughs> all right. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thanks.